Hi. So I'm going to give a small introduction about the conference and the collective. So Collective for Architecture Lebanon uh, is a nonprofit organization that was established earlier this year. And we aim to create a cross-disciplinary platform for discussion and debate between the fields of architecture, um, design, urban planning, and the humanities. And um, to do that, uh, we are organizing events such as Omran, which is the first uh, architectural forum, so it's the first edition. And uh, this year's main theme is architecture of the territory, the paradoxical relationship between the state and its territorial planning. So we launched earlier uh, last week through the uh, opening of the exhibition at Bid Beirut. So we invite you all to go and see it. And um, I'm going to uh, give a little introduction about the conference. We have four rounds over two days. And um, the key speakers are going to discuss and debate uh, the following question. To what extent does the planning of a territory rely on its governing power structure? So the paradox that exists between the state and its territorial planning is due to the lack of its stability, which results in a weak or non-existent uh, strategy and in a weaker national unity. So it must be stressed that Lebanon is an anomaly uh, in the global planning trend. Elsewhere in the world, uh, the relationship between the state and its territory, it's a very intimate uh, relationship where its functionality is dictated by an organization of the territory. So in Lebanon, obviously, this is not the case. The state benefits from a lack of planning since its imaginary power rests in the post-1990s power-sharing division of governmental positions and this unfair distribution uh, across the territory which leaves the territory unrepresented. So the flagrant economic, political, and social failure of Lebanon uh, as a state has made, made it urgent to rethink its, uh, essential, the essential role of the architect as a primordial figure in the implementation of a territorial and uh, urban plan strategy in order to achieve a cohesive nation state. But Omran will pose a, a premise that must also be questioned. Is a cohesive nation state the ultimate goal or is there the possibility for the assimilation of a post-nation state condition? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for being here. And first of all, I just want to thank uh, Cal for organizing, can you hear me? For organizing this uh, conference and also the exhibition. Um, before I start uh, introducing the, the keynote uh, speaker, I just want to uh, you know, uh, tell you a little bit about the round one, which will be about the global versus the local, or the global and the local, and it looks at this kind of dichotomy that exists in um, you know, the, the morphological uh, changes that have resulted in, um, that, have result that are basically the result of war and uh, violent master planning um, in a city like uh, Beirut, but also that we are all too familiar with in this region. Um, our first keynote speaker is uh, Adrian Lahoud. Adrian Lahoud is the Dean of the School of Architecture at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, he is currently also the curator of the inaugural uh, edition of the Sharjah Architecture Triennial of 2019, which is bound to open in uh, November of 2019. Um, and it is entitled The Rights of Future Generations. Um, uh, prior to his uh, position at the RCA, uh, Adrian Lahoud was the director of the MA program at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmith, and he was also a fellow in the Forensic Architecture Project. He was uh, also the director of the MARC Urban Design at the Bartlett at UCL. Um, and his uh, recent exhibits, uh, he has recently exhibited at uh, places such as the Sirso Museum in Beirut, uh, After Belonging, which is the 2016 architecture uh, triennial, triennial in Oslo, um, the HKW at, in Berlin, where he was also a contributor to the Anthropocene uh, Curriculum and the Technosphere Projects. Um, he has uh, also um, published uh, widely. Uh, his uh, most recent publications include The Mediterranean, A New Imaginary in Geographies by Harvard University Press, 
Floating Bodies in Forensis, uh, The Architecture of Public Truth by Sternberg Press, um, Fallen Cities in the Arab City, uh, Architecture and Representation, published by Columbia University Press. Um, he has also um, given presentations and lectured uh, all over the world, including at the GSAP, at Columbia University in New York, uh, at Princeton University, Harvard, and the ETH in, the, in Zurich. With her, without further ado, please help me in welcoming Adrian Lahoud. I think it's going to come up. Um, thank you very much to the organizers. Maybe we need some, give it a minute. Okay. Thank you very much to the organizers. Um, and the theme of today's event on uh, the architecture, architecture in the territory, I think is, for me, um, extremely urgent um, as a concept. I think it acquires a particular kind of urgency in the last few years as a consequence of all of the challenges that we're facing um, around climate change. I want to start with maybe some also just general open questions in terms of how do we, how do we understand this idea of the territory or the territorial? Um, and for me, I think it is about a certain relationship between land and the soul. And, and hopefully this will become clearer during the presentation. That is to say, what is the relationship between the land and the soul? Is a relationship between a certain model or an idea of the environment and a certain model or idea of human subjectivity and to understand the way that these two things um, affect each other. That is to say, in really simple terms, how we live, how we work, how we socialize, how we reproduce. Um, which is to say that for me, the territory has a, very, a fundamentally existential dimension. Yeah? And I, I, this is what I want to try and draw out in some of these presentations. I'm going to talk about two projects, um, both from the Royal College of Art, um, the first is examining the idea of the territorial, but through the lens of the domestic. Um, and the second is looking at the territorial through the lens of resource extraction, and especially the encounter between resource extraction um, and indigenous societies. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to draw out some of the, 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 also the challenges that you posed at the beginning around the kind of paradoxical nature of of, of, of territorial planning, and especially this relationship between the local and the global, yeah, and, and to, to, because ultimately I think this question of scale is really fundamental when we're, when we're moving between these very intimate conditions of domesticity and thinking about um, the, the territory as a whole. So, let's, let's start. Okay, so this is the first project I'm gonna talk about, which is, um, about the idea of city design and how we might mobilize new technologies, especially um, machine learning. So does anybody, or can anybody tell me um, what is special about this list of cities? Does anybody know? If you were at the AUB lecture, um, you might remember. Sorry? Density, not quite. It has something to do with population. Do you notice where most of them are? Yeah. So it's, it's a list of what is estimated to be the top 20 cities in terms of population by the year 2100. Um, and do you know how many of these are in the current top 20? Only five. Yeah. So there's no Shanghai. There's no Tokyo. There's no Sao Paulo, yeah. So to me, that indicates a, a, a profound reorientation, transformation in the kind of center of gravity. And I think as, as architects, that's something that we should be paying a lot of attention to. So in the next 33 years, it's estimated we would have to build cities for an additional 2.5 billion people Now, if we were to build, house these, um, this population from scratch, that would be equal to a new United Kingdom and Ireland um, every year. But of course, with a completely different um, mode of existence, a different form of life. It would be equal to a new Barcelona, 
every week, but of course with a radically different kind of urban environment. And if we were to build these buildings from scratch, it would equal 280,000 new houses, or 24,000 new six-story buildings, or 2,000 60-story buildings every single week. So there's a kind of incredible set of statistics um, that just alert us to the incredible increase in mass, um, in built material, in urbanization, with the specter of everything that we know about climate change, um, about resource use, um, et cetera, hovering in the background. And this is the condition that we enter into as architects at the moment. So what will it look like? What will this, what will this new form of urbanization look like? Who will design it? Who will build it? And most importantly, what quality of life will be possible? And these are really just general statistics. So let's look at the value of the global construction industry. In 2017, it was worth eight trillion. Um, in 2020, it was worth, uh, in 2020, it's estimated it would be worth 13 trillion. And of course, what's being built here are not just buildings, they're institutions, businesses, mobility systems, energy systems, waste systems, water systems, sanitation. Two out of every th three of those dollars in the previous statistic in the construction industry will be spent in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, which is, again, another completely extraordinary statistic, um, a major shift in the center of gravity. Oops. So currently, we think that about 60% of the... Sorry, can I just get a hand with the... Um, yeah, okay, that's fine. So currently, 60% of the world's capital is tied up in real estate, um, which is an enormous amount. Um, plus, we're also finding that there's huge amounts of capital flight um, from so-called developing world um, into so-called safe cities, um, places like Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai, but also London, of course, um, Sydney, um, Hong Kong. We also know that foreign capital is one of the major drivers of the real estate market and, and housing prices. Um, uh, in these cities. This is not really about economics, it's, it's actually about power. Um, from an economic perspective, it's completely insane, actually, um, that capital appreciation on real estate um, in, in these kinds of cities um, is such that you know, your, your, your property will earn more money than you do uh, in, in many cases. Yeah? Um, and it's, why is it insane? It's because the property is not really contributing anything to the economy. It's just a dumb pile of bricks that kind of just sits there. Um, you get up every morning, you brush your teeth, you go to work, you contribute to the economy. Um, you know, uh, and yet, um, very often, um, houses, um, in terms of their increase in equity, um, generate more income. Um, so think about that as a kind of economic structure and, and, and what it means to have so much private finance tied up in real estate in, in, in all of these kinds of societies, well, that, that money could be swirling around the economy doing all kinds of other productive beneficial work like investing in research, investing in um, education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So at the same time, um, there's been a complete revolution in the urban economy um, across the world, built on the back of data, data analysis, things like Google Maps, um, Google Street View especially. We're all familiar with these kinds of technologies, things like LiDAR um, and remote sensing. Um, there's a kind of revolution taking place in the way we're understanding the city at the same time. Yeah, so at the same time as this incredible growth, um, there's also a, a complete transformation in the kinds of quantitative information that we're developing um, around cities. So this is a, a really nice example. Um, this is a project in Sri Lanka that identifies whether a roof is made from aluminium, asbestos, clay, or concrete. That information is then cross-referenced to economic data and in theory um, provides a, a way of capturing economic well-being um, and poverty rates in that, in that city. So anyway, a lot of these processes are new. Um, but the tradition of thinking about the city quantitatively is um, almost 200 years old. In fact, you know, you would argue, you could argue, these quantitative forms of um, calculation around cities have been at the heart of major urban transformations 
historically. We can think about the, you know, the most classic example is um, John Snow's famous cholera map, which identified waste and water as the source of disease transmission um, and leads to one of the greatest programs of public works in history um, during the Victorian era. Um, they you know, built the extraordinary network of sewers um, and eventually leads to cholera's eradication. Um, the same can be said for the vast improvement um, in living conditions that takes place in the 19th century in cities like London. Um, for example, the, the, also the iconic Charles Booth um, poverty map, um, this time focusing on um, living standards, public health, and, and, and morality. And of course, the, initi the initiatives of really important um, social organizations like the Peabody Trust that begin to really revolutionize housing provision and improve standards of living for thousands of people. So then, of course, new housing types evolve as a consequence of learning to see the city in scientific terms um, and, and in a new kind of way. So this project that we're looking at um, is really applying itself to a kind of a, a conundrum, perhaps a paradox, um, or a blind spot in terms of the way that we understand the city. We spend 90% of our time indoors, yeah? Um, that's a kind of average. Depending on the climate and the city that you're in, it can be slightly lower, um, around 80%. Um, it can be higher, around 93%, but that, that's a kind of average. So we're, we're basically cave dwellers, yeah? We still spend all of our time inside. Um, in all this time, however, the interior of the building has remained um, a kind of mystery from, uh, well, at least from that numerical perspective. And of course, there are different kinds of initiatives that are trying to address that, and they raise all kinds of really complicated issues around privacy. Um, for example, apps that convert point cloud scans of your home into 3D models, um, but because they rely on people scanning their own homes, they don't really scale up. Um, there are more ingenious slash pernicious approaches. I don't know if you ever came across this. Um, you know, if anyone has like a Roomba robot, you know, one of these little automated vacuum cleaners. Um, part of the business plan for Roomba was that they would actually um, trace the floor plan of your home and uh, accumulate the data and therefore accumulate a data set of the layouts of, in, of people's houses. Um, and then it would on-sell information about your floor plan um, while it vacuums your house, while it cleans your house. Um, and of course, things like Alexa and, and, and all of the other various um, uh, you know, interventions in the domestic sphere by companies like Google and Amazon and Apple um, are all doing very, very similar things. So at the moment, everyone recognizes that the domestic interior is a kind of next frontier of quantification and calculation. Yeah. And of course, the interests of major corporations are simply just to monetize that, yeah? They want to know what you're doing, where, they want to know your consumption patterns in, um, in really minute detail. They want to cross-reference that to your spending patterns, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there is a kind of uh, a race, in a sense, to try to develop um, more sophisticated understandings of the, um, of the domestic interior. And so this design of the spaces um, where we spend 90% of our lives becomes the latest frontier in a conflict between public and private interests. So recall the following. When we're talking about um, this built mass of, um, of, um, of urbanization um, this pop you know, driven by this population increase, and then think about cities that have you know, incredible housing crises, um, cities like London, like Beirut, like Sydney, um, et cetera. Um, you know, in cases where there is at least some um, minimal form of public ownership of housing assets, it's incredible, it's incredible that we have no idea, we have no large scale, statistically relevant information on the layouts of those dwellings, yeah? And it's really complicated because of course the layouts of those dwellings are, I mean, especially in a city like London, um, oftentimes hundreds of years old. The plans are located in um, municipal archives, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But if 
there is, in, and, and, and so what this project is trying to do is actually is therefore to try to use machine learning, um, a kind of like optical character recognition for floor plans um, to find out whether we can create large scale data sets of domestic interiors for large parts of cities, yeah? um, where there is public ownership of those housing assets. And therefore to put that, to put that information at the disposal of municipalities or of public housing bodies or public authorities, yeah? Why is that important? Well, for the very first time, we might be able to, to examine the kinds of building typologies that we have um, and to understand whether they're relevant to modern forms of life, yeah? Um, is the automatic reproduction of a two or three bedroom apartment organized around the model of the nuclear family really the most efficient way of producing housing in cities today? For sure it's not. We know the real estate industry is extremely conservative. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's very reluctant to experiment um, or to engage with different kinds of um, uh, living models. And so the kind of wager in this project is that by putting together for the, for we think the first time, a kind of statistical representation of um, domestic interiors at a really large scale, we'll actually provide public authorities with a tool that will enable them to understand the value of their existing assets and then to measure those assets against demographic data to see whether actually, first of all, the existing asset base is relevant to the way people are living but also to provide a kind of numerical scientific tool and an evidence base that might be able to drive transformation in the delivery of um, new kinds of housing. So that's project one. The second project um, shifts in scale um, and it's really much more about um, resource extraction So it's called the Scales of Justice, Energy Transition Rights and Indigenous Title. Um, and it's evolving out of a project, that, um, out of a, a new program that we've developed at the um, Royal College of Art. It's an MA program in environmental architecture. And it's really looking at the way that, I mean, and you can see here, um, and, and especially in light of the, the kind of catastrophe that's unfolding at the moment um, in Brazil. This is an Im image of deforestation um, in Amazonian rainforests. It's really looking at that kind of intersection between um, resource extraction, um, because resource extraction is still important. You know, we still need to extract resources um, and the kind of ecological crisis that we're facing, but in a, in a very, very particular kind of way. So while we Acknowledge that the impact of humanity in environmental change is, is, is kind of, you know, is, is without question. We still need to recognize that architecture is not a secondary character in these processes. In fact, on the contrary, architecture is itself a kind of environmental agent. Um, be it because the construction industry is the source of more than 50% of carbon dioxide emissions, or more importantly, because architecture's designs and interventions have a direct environmental impact on the Earth's ecosystems. So in response to this, this kind of um, challenge, we, we set up this program, the MA Environmental Architecture, um, as an attempt to try to redefine the relationship between architecture, landscape, and environmental science. Um, the program sets out a new space of knowledge production and, and project-based expertise and design intervention that aims to challenge dis disciplinary boundaries, um, assist policy making, support human rights organizations, social movements or community groups, and to reconfigure the way we think, design, and protect the future of the earth and its inhabitants. So in the context of transition from fossil fuels which is where we are now, to clean forms of energy. Um, the inaugural studio set out to look at the contradictions involved in green technologies. What you can see here is um, a, a lithium evaporation, a series of lithium evaporation ponds in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So this is where we've been working for the last three years um, with a series of indigenous groups. And lithium is also is kind of fascinating, yeah? So, I mean, I think, 
it's fair to say that if the 1950s was really defined by the discovery of oil, and that since then, the great acceleration in urbanization, in population growth, um, also in pollution, in, in, um, in, in, has been built on the back of the carbon, a, a kind of carbon economy, yeah. Um, lithium, on the other hand, um, is at the very core of all decarbonization models, yeah, because we know that renewable energy sources, so if we think about solar, wind, um, geothermal, they need some kind of medium to move them around. Yeah, you, need, you need a medium to store them in. So it's not like oil, coal, and gas. You can put them on the back of a train or put them in a barrel or put them on a ship and move them somewhere. Um, you can't move renewables around. You need to collect them at their source. You need to store them, and then you need to transport them. Yeah, so we know that um, everyone carries bits of lithium around with them in their mobile phones. Um, and lithium is to our era, what petroleum will be to the era of the 1950s and the generation of the 1950s, it will be one of the most, it is already becoming one of the most important resources in the world. It is a, it's kind of like the definitional commodity. Um, at the same time, the global production networks and commodity chains that support lithium reconfigure extensive territories in the global south. So our research focuses on the social and ecological tensions that characterize processes of lithium extraction across what is called the lithium triangle, so in Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia, highlighting environmental disputes between indigenous populations, state interests, and global mining corporations. This is the Chilean dimension of the, of the research. Um, we're just about to start a comparative phase where we're looking at lithium extraction in Australia as well. So, Following closely to its uh, fossil fuel-based precedents, the extraction of lithium has destabilized the socio-environmental systems within which it is embedded. The process of extraction and the development of associated infrastructure has affected watercourses, aquifers, soil, flora, and fauna. Salt flats, where you extract lithium from, are at the center of really complex social ecologies. As oasis in the desert, they are essential for indigenous people as their marshes, water, and pasture are needed for agro-pastoral activity. And the disruptive nature of lithium extraction is particularly evident in areas surrounding um, the Salada de Atacama in Chile, um, where several cases of water overconsumption have been reported. Um, so in recent years, local indigenous organizations have started to mobilize against lithium extraction. At stake is both water, which is a rare and precious commodity in desert areas, but more importantly, um, a dispute over rights to development and different kinds of development models, ultimately a dispute over um, alternative modes of existence. And it's within this context that this project sets out to intervene with research on the kinds of environmental futures that are emerging from within this um, really unique context. So there's two parts to this project. One part is the studios, uh, the studio-based practice that we've been running through the MA in environmental architecture. Um, the second part of it is um, a staff research project where we're looking at a comparative study between Chile um, and Australia. And I think it's really important for, for me to, um, to explain that like also methodologically, there are existing disputes taking place in both of these sites and we, we see our role um, and not to just go over there and conduct research, um, but actually to insert ourselves and to align ourselves with the indigenous groups and, and to support them in their struggle. So in a way, like they, they define the terms of the research and, and we, play, we play a kind of support role. I think that's extremely important to set out. Um, here you can see some of the students doing work on, on one of their field trips. So, I'll get a little bit more, um, we'll go into a little bit more detail um, uh, just, just now towards the end of the lecture um, as a way of like focusing on what I characterize as um, two interacting and in a way conflicting claims around rights of future generations as they're expressed in a lithium extraction. Um, this is to go back to your introduction at the beginning around the, the relationship between the global and the local. So on one hand, we know that 
there are global scale rights of future generations expressed in things like carbon mitigation pathways that promote the exploitation of lithium resources. Yeah? So we know at, a, at the scale of the globe, the extraction of lithium is an unequivocal good. Yeah? Because for sure, if, if Beirut tomorrow had an entire city full of electric vehicles, the air quality would transform overnight. The health benefits would be unprecedented. Yeah. So, so it's a kind of unequivocal good. Getting rid of fossil fuels, getting rid of um, petrol, diesel cars in cities, and electrifying them has potentially untold benefits. So at the scale of the city and the globe, and in terms of rights of future generations and thinking about the environment, um, lithium extraction is an unequivocal good. Conversely, we also know that the sites of lithium extraction are often homes to different kinds of indigenous groups and that their environments are being destroyed as a consequence of this interaction. Yeah. And they also have local claims for rights of their own generations, for their ancestors, etc. So how do we start to balance these two conflicting claims for rights of future generations, one expressed at a global scale and one expressed at a local scale? This is, um, and uh, I'm just gonna take you through some images of uh, a recent uh, field work that we did um, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is one of the most incredible places in the world. I encourage everyone to go and visit. This is um, Likan Kabur, which is a really important volcano. So lithium batteries are at the center of global decarbonization efforts based on green technologies. While many of the world's most significant lithium deposits exist in ecologically fragile ancestral lands, the urgent demand for lithium has outpaced research on its impact, requiring new interdisciplinary approaches and alternatives to Western-centric theories and practices. A comparative analysis of environmental claims along the lithium supply chain and a program of knowledge exchange aims to identify new socio-environmental practices and conceptual frameworks for assessing and co-measuring local and global ecological rights claims. And this will be done through a series of public symposia and workshops. Um, the, uh, as I said before, the first part of the research is, um, is concluded. That was uh, the field work in Chile. The second part of the research is uh, working with a, another indigenous group in Australia. The third part of the research will be um, bringing on board people who are working on green technologies. Um, so large scale corporations are doing really in innovative work on green technologies, on lithium batteries, on electric vehicles and bringing them to the same room as the, um, the different indigenous groups um, whose lands um, contain the lithium deposits that all those technologies depend on. Yeah? I think this will be the first time that these kinds of discussions um, will have taken place. So what we're trying to do is, is to develop a new interdisciplinary understanding of claims for rights of future generations, which, as, as was mentioned at the beginning, is also the, um, the theme of the Shadra Architecture Triennial. Um, a new understanding of concepts of environmental justice, which I think is incredibly important, expressed at different scales in order to inform theories of fair and equitable development in the global commons. A further aim is to critically contextualize Western-centric frameworks for deciding and adjudicating on competing rights claims and alternative development pathways in order to foster a deeper intercultural understanding um, and leading to, we hope, improved environmental and socio-environmental justice um, in the context of impending climate change. So we could su summarize the research project um, as follows. To examine and compare frameworks for assessing socio-environmental costs and benefit of the lithium-led energy transition. I'll say a few words about that in a moment. Um, to review and compare existing legal concepts and precedents um, concerning or affecting the lithium supply chain. To study and compare alternative concepts, methods, and tools of environmental modeling and impact assessment. And to study the contribution of concepts and practices emerging from indigenous rights claims to global climate disputes and vice versa. And so here we enter into a really complex relationship in terms of um, the tension between scales, between the local scale and the global scale. We know that climate change is often conceived of as a global problem, yeah? Um, and I think this is a really pernicious and despotic way to think about climate change. And it's something I've written a lot about in the past, 
is that when we start to think about climate change in terms of a global average, what we do is we efface the specific struggles um, that affect specific peoples in different regions. Yeah? Um, and, and we know this in terms of you know, the argument over uh, the Paris Accord and, and whether it would be one degree, 1.5 degree increase, two degree increase. This is still the way climate change is being framed. Um, on the other hand, all of the IPCC models um, that set out the really urgent pathways to, um, to decarbonisation absolutely depend on uh, lithium um, in order to achieve their goals. So we know that reducing emissions is absolutely necessary to attain the objectives of the, global, of the Paris Accord. Um, a transition away from fossil fuels towards um, renewable energies plays a fundamental role in abating the effects of global warming, thereby delivering benefits to vulnerable populations. And if, we know that if this transition is not implemented rapidly, the burden of mitigation will disproportionately fall to future generations. Yeah? So, there's a, so there's a really interesting problem of intergenerational equity. Yeah? So the less that we do as a generation, the more future generations, our children, other kin, um, will bear a, a kind of increased responsibility. Um, so this question of intergenerational equity, I think, is something um, which is extremely important. And in a way, the, the entire Sharjah Architecture Triennial is based on a premise, which is that the intergenerational relationship, understanding the intergenerational relationship and its importance is actually at the heart of the struggle against climate change. Yeah. We need to reframe this intergenerational relationship in a completely new way. And this is where also working with indigenous societies becomes incredibly important um, because of the value that's still placed on um, on, on thinking intergenerationally. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to move forward and wrap up a little bit. Um, so lithium deposits occupy the traditional lands of indigenous people such as the Aymara, the Koya, the Quechua, and the Likan Antai in Chile, and the Okola, the Njmal, and the Ndaju in Australia. In Chile, the salt flats where lithium is extracted are the centre of complex social ecologies. In Australia, there are repositories of sacred sites for within the Aboriginal Dreamtime, their homes to endangered species and to important totems. In both cases, the social impact of extraction is felt at the scale of societies whose proximity to sites of lithium extraction makes their economies, ecosystems and social practices highly vulnerable. Um, in this regard, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People of 2007 provides a really important point of reference, um, helping to eliminate human rights violations against Indigenous people, combating discrimination, impoverishment, and the impact of extractive industries. And increasingly, at international and national levels, through charters, treaties, and conventions, rights of future generations have emerged within international law to safeguard freemen, freedoms and opportunities of those yet to be born. And of course, those things are, are, are as we speak, being completely incinerated um, in many places of the world, most, in, in the most extreme sense, of course, by Bolsonaro in, um, in Brazil. So as I said before, in the context of lithium, and we could think about other resources in, in different kinds of ways, um, justifiable claims for rights of future generations exist at both the local and the global scales. But they do so in absence of any mechanisms that allow us to adjudicate between them. And this is evidence of a normative um, and methodological disconnection between the two different types of claims and our inability to make alternative legal orders, sites, traditions, and, um, and systems of knowledge production commensurate, yeah? So how do, you, how, do you, um, how do you compare an indigenous understanding of the landscape um, to a scientific one, to an economic one? It's, ex it's, it's kind of extremely difficult. Um, and of course, that we know that most of the research, and especially things like environmental impact statements, um, are very, very Western-centric, and they bias towards certain kinds of um, ways of understanding the environment. So how do we introduce other kinds of concepts and other kinds of claims um, within that kind of framework? The project's gonna to bring together a series of um, architects, lawyers, anthropologists, and environmental historians, um, working alongside a group of indigenous leaders, climate engineers, and advocacy groups to evaluate how concepts of evidence are modified and transformed by rights claims, including, and, and this is extremely important, how cultural artifacts and environments themselves constitute alternative forms of evidence within disputes. 
for example, the way an Aboriginal painting might be accepted as proof of native title. Yeah. Um, so how does, how does a painting um, enter into a court in order to demonstrate an intergenerational relationship to the land? Yeah. Um, and that example of the painting um, will be the subject of the talk that I'm going to give at, um, at Ashkal Alwan on Monday at 8 p.m. Um, I won't say too much about it, except that I think it's one of the most important paintings in the world. It was produced by 40 Aboriginal artists in 1997 um, in Australia. It was a collective painting measuring eight by 10 meters. Um, and using it, they won back an area twice the size of the Netherlands, around 86,000 kilometers in, in a really landmark environmental uh, land claim dispute in Australia. Um, we're bringing it to Sharjah for the triennial. So, so if, if um, would, yeah, I'd love you to come to Ashkala Wan. I think it's a really, really exciting project, but I'll, I'll say more about it then. Um, but this question of like co-measuring and, and different epistemological practices and how important a kind of sensitivity to those different kinds of epistemological practices um, is for this kind of work um, can be underscored in all kinds of ways. So, so for example, um, in, in Australia, which is a context I'm quite familiar with, um, indigenous groups in New South Wales um, know that whales are migrating northward up the coast when a flower reaches a certain height. Yeah. So they know when that flower reaches the height, that certain height, the whales will be traveling up the coast. They also know when that flower blooms, the whales will be traveling back southwards towards the, um, towards the Antarctic. So from an indigenous perspective, what we find is that rather than producing a kind of metric, yeah, so temperature, degrees, you know, standardized units, et cetera, et cetera, you find a series of as associations between things, yeah, and an incredibly nuanced and sensitive understanding of the association between those things. Now, the flower blooming and the whales migrating are driven by ocean temperatures. So there's a really, you know, there's a, there's a scientific explanation for it. Um, or well, there's two scientific explanations for it. One scientific explanation uses um, ocean temperature measurements, and the other one uses the blooming of a flower. Yeah, and it's those relationships between those those two different forms of knowledge that we find really, really fascinating and exciting. To wrap up, um, so climate policy um, and climate justice depend on anticipatory decision making, able to weigh future benefits against harm at all scales. Um, environmental disputes over the impact of uh, resource extraction, especially lithium extraction, entails these very complex negotiations between alternative legal and spatial and environmental concepts. Um, so this proposal, this research project, asks how global and local impacts of the green energy transition are being co-measured, and thereby um, um, giving us tools to be able to adjudicate between those different scales of claims. Global climate policy is predicated on a range of recommendations and agreements that flow from the Paris Accord of 2015. While local disputes over resource extraction are informed by a specific set of international declarations, such as the UN um, DRIP or the ILO Convention of 1969. So two key problems emerge from this. What normative frameworks are able to address issues of climate and environmental justice? And how can distinct concepts of temporal rights, rights of future generations, or ancestral rights be addressed in law and or jurisprudence and according to what principle? Environmental impact assessments at both global and local scales require concepts and representational tools able to visually evidence complex socio-environmental interactions. While climate science relies on quantitative methods Local disputes often rely on qualitative perspectives. So this project asks how alternative forms of evidence, such as environmental modification, cultural artifacts like painting, um, or indigenous titling, are made commensurate with Western representations of the territory, um, such as cartography, surveys, and deeds. Despite increasing scholarship that indigenous knowledge is systematic, rational, and relevant, indeed is, is science, um, efforts to redress the absence of indigenous environmental perspectives in climate research are still underdeveloped. Emerging work on ecological jurisprudence and legal pluralism points to the challenges posed to concepts like property um, by alternative epistemological frameworks, arguing that more attention be paid to relational 
and qualitative descriptions of the environment. So this project asks how indigenous concepts and representational practices contribute to global discussions of climate justice. And I think I can leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, jo just a small question to, uh, about a detail on the lithium research. I was wondering if you're looking also at the garbage produced by lithium and the mm -hmm. way lithium travels once it's consumed. Yeah. Because it travels again, which is another global yeah. local relationship. Yeah, Quite yeah, no, exactly. Powerful. Yeah, so, so lithium, lithium at the site of its, um, so there's two main issues with lithium in terms of the supply chain. The first is like when it's taken out of the ground, is it, so in Chile, lithium's a, a brine, so it exists as a saline solution in water, which is why you have those beautiful evaporation ponds. They basically get rid of the water and they collect the lithium. In Australia, it's an ore, so it's like a rock, so they dig it out of the ground. In both cases, um, the main impact is in terms of like the water right, and pollution and water usage. At the other end of the supply chain, um, which we haven't started to look at yet, which is the third part of the project, um, but which you're pointing to is an ext and is extremely important, is um, batteries and recycling batteries and what to do with all the lithium waste products. Um, and that, that's an that's, that's a, that's a incredibly difficult um, challenge, but we, yeah, we haven't started looking at that yet. Hello. Um, at the beginning of your lecture, you were talking about the importance of relating a landscape with the soul. Um, I, I got in your presentation a very clear idea about how to deal with a scientific uh, uh, kind of uh, measuring, cartographing of, of new realities and so on. But I wonder if you could elaborate more on how to research on that uh, relationship that you were mm -hmm. mentioning. Yeah, um, I think housing reform is always an attempt to produce new kinds of human beings. <laughs> um, human beings that are more moral, that are heterosexual, um, that have two children, in which the woman stays at home, <laughs> does housework. You know, I mean, the, the history of housing is the history of um, the sexualization of childhood, of, of, of normative gender relationships and gender roles, of all kinds of new ideas of what human beings should be like. And that's what I mean by the soul. Um, I think if, if and, as, and, and as soon as we disconnect housing from those kinds of questions, um, then I think we, we really depoliticize housing in a, in a very, in a fatal way, yeah? The worst thing to do with housing is to convert it into a numerical problem, yeah? Uh, a problem of supply, yeah? We have, we need 30,000 flats this year. Um, we only made 20,000, yeah? Um, and, and I think even though those numerical aspects are really important, as, I, as I've mentioned, um, and in a way, what's interesting always is the interception of this, like that kind of scientific dimension with what I described as a kind of existential dimension in housing. Um, and, so, and so if you're interested in those kinds of things, um, I think there are, there's, there's a countless um, examples of, of, of books um, and of research um, that have really focused on moments of, of really major housing reform in terms of the kind of ambitions of the state 
um, and especially, let's say, like the, the power of the state, but also the limits of the state in producing new kinds of human beings and new kinds of social relationships. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, a really quick example. If if you if you just think about um, how natural it seems to us to live in a like a two bedroom ap apartment with a nuclear family with you know um, a male and female couple and some children. Um, that model of living together and that form of spatial organization is about 150 years old, you know. Human beings have lived in all kinds of ways, um, have socialized in all kinds of ways, have entered into reproductive relationships in all kinds of ways, has assumed all kinds of different gender roles in history. Um, and so think about how much training it's taken, which we haven't even noticed, to walk into that apartment and to think, this is how people live, yeah, without even noticing. It's, like it's invisible, right, that it's a transformation. But we're in it and we're in the middle of it. Um, and I think paying attention to those historical transformations is really important. Um, and I think it's one of the most important things you can learn as an architect because it also suggests that people have lived in different ways in the past and therefore might live together in different ways in the future. Um, and I think that's an incredibly liberating and politically important thing to learn as an architect. Much, uh, Adrian. Um, thank you for this beautiful lecture. Um, I just want to introduce, uh, you know, a, a small uh, interjection by Matilda Khouri, who is an architect and an urbanist who works at the intersection between the natural environment and the man-made, uh, and the man-made, basically. And she is an elected uh, member. Uh, she's elected council member at the Beirut municipality. Uh, so please help me in welcoming Matilda Khouri. much. Uh, good morning. I haven't prepared the presentation because I was asked yesterday actually to, to pass by. First, I would like to say uh, we're very happy uh, to be uh, part of this event and uh, I would like actually to thank and compliment uh, Adrian on a very interesting presentation, a very thought-provoking presentation actually, which is A very thought-provoking presentation, which is at the you know um, crossing edge between what we do as architects and what the world around us. Um, traditionally, uh, I mean, I, I, I was and I am an AUB alumni. We graduated in the early 90s, and traditionally, architecture used to be taught as architects usually build. And you know, early on, from the early 90s, you know. Um, uh, for me, that was not the concept that I would have liked to pursue. And early on, I pursued more environmental and energy, actually, and environmental design, because uh, really architecture and our role as architects in shaping our environment and our responsibility towards natural resources, uh, towards what the earth stands for and what spaces stands for, what landscape stands for, and what does the built environment stands for. And for me, these thoughts are really at the heart of what we as architects should be and are. Uh, today, I'm not going to make a presentation. I haven't prepared anything. Uh, but I would like to make you know, a small um, uh, thought on what my position now at the Municipal Council of Beirut has enabled me to do or is enabling me to, to actually intervene in things that would have normally uh, have been shaped differently. Uh, so in 2016, which was three years ago, um, I was uh, approached uh, uh, and told, would I be interested to, to be a member of the Municipal Council of Beirut? My first reaction was, no, thank you. Uh, but then I thought, why not? Um, so I said, yes. And since then, uh, really, it's a, it's a dual um, 
environment. At the one hand, there is so much potential. It's such a privilege to be placed in a position whereby, yes, I can shape every decision that goes on the city. In theory, yes, I can. The other, the reverse side of that, the flip side of that, is that to shape these things, the, the process is, is like overwhelming and exhausting and archaic to the point that very little change happens. Uh, having said that, this, this is you know, the intervention of, of a different uh, nature, but some of the things that are in line with what Adrian was proposing, and I'm just going to talk briefly for a minute or two about Beirut, because we all live in Beirut. Uh, Beirut is the capital of Lebanon, obviously. Beirut is subject to climate change, is very much vulnerable to climate change like any place on Earth. Uh, Beirut will be subject to sea level rise. Beirut will be subject to temperature rise. Beirut will be subject to reduced rainfall. Beirut will be subject to uh, coastal, uh, potential coastal flooding or, or, or um, uh, coastal change. So what are we doing about all of these things? This is just from a perspective from the global and the local. How Beirut, how can we prepare Beirut to better deal with all of these issues? Beirut will be subject to flash floods. You know, just on a basic day-to-day -day activity, is the Beirut infrastructure ready for that? Uh, what are the pressures that are currently Beirut is subject to and which will be exacerbated by additional global events happening around Beirut? Some of the obvious pressures which we all actually live, have to live with every day. We all know the, the problems of transport, uh, power supply, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, solid waste management, uh, um, all of these are, you know, a constant day-to-day -day pressures on every Beirut and every Lebanese person who actually visits Beirut or lives in Beirut. So what, as a what we as a municipality can we do uh, about all of these pressures? Um, we have several projects in the pipeline. I don't know if there's time today to talk, to discuss about some of these projects. Many of those pipeline projects deal with public transport, obviously, energy efficiency, uh, many of them deal with public spaces. What is the relationship of the citizen to a public space? How can we improve public spaces? How can we connect these public spaces? How can we improve gentle mobility within the city? How can we improve the perception of, of uh, being in a city or, or actually appreciating our city? Obviously, Beirut has so much potential and so much to offer. A lot of you know, Beirut's assets needs to be brought forward and they need to be highlighted, they need to be uh, put in, in, in value. The, the entire, you know, uh, global competitive positioning of Beirut, whether as a city or as a, from the, the neighborhood um, uh, scale, me living in Beirut, from a city scale, Beirut as the capital of Lebanon, from a regional scale, Beirut, as a, as, a, as a pole in its region, or from a global scale, Beirut's positioning in the planet and how can we play and how can we shape and modify um, the role of that city. We're all concerned. Um, what can, you started mentioning by the role of the state or the role of the public uh, sector versus the role of the private sector. For me, I see myself as both. I don't see clear, uh, clear cutting lines that say this is the role of the state or the role of the public sector and this is the role of the private or the, the uh, non-governmental sector. I don't see that there, there are clear lines. I, I see that you know, this is a space whereby we should all intervene. And uh, obviously today I haven't prepared a presentation and there is no time to actually uh, discuss the various issues, but I would like to highlight and to thank Adrian again for you know, three key concepts. Our relationships to our public spaces, to our landscapes, to, our, to the natural environment again, uh, around us is more than just uh, uh, a relationship of need or use of resources. It's, it's an existential uh, bond. And I'm glad that this, this link was brought forward. And I hope that every architect who graduates, graduates and goes on to work within the framework of that concept. As architects, we are responsible for everything around us and for shaping, and, and not just shaping, irrespective of shaping, for, for interacting with the world around us. Uh, one minor uh, last note, in parallel to my involvement at the city of Beirut, I'm also involved on um, uh, projects dealing with um, 
I just happen to be currently involved in a project dealing with the Lake Karaun pollution prevention project and pollution prevention for the entire Litani River, which is, as most of you know, it's a river which starts in Bika and uh, uh, goes 170 kilometers through the Bekaa Valley uh, all the way to the Mediterranean. Now, all of this, the catchment area of the Litani River and all of the urban uh, pressure around the Litani River has made that it is a highly uh, polluted, uh, non-protected uh, uh, catchment basin or environment. So what we as planners, as architects, as, as responsible for the future growth of our cities and, and our uh, uh, built up environment, how can we minimize these pressures on the, our natural resources and how can we improve uh, the management of these uh, natural resources? I have the opportunity to be involved currently in both and I hope I'll have more chance in the future to talk about the actual uh, projects uh, because there, I mean, there are a lot of potential in Lebanon, a lot of interesting projects are happening. I'd like to um, ask you as, as you know, future graduates or current practitioners to be involved in, you know, in all of these projects because yes, we do have the, the actually uh, capacity and opportunity to make a difference in every one of these projects. And I'd like to thank you and say, thank Adrian. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Yeva Saudargeite, uh, who is a Lithuanian Lebanese photographer who, uh, and a visual uh, artist who's based in Beirut um, and who grew up between Lithuania, Beirut, and the UAE. Uh, Yeva studied architecture at the Lebanese American University and uh, at the Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris. Um, usually site-specific, her practice spans different uh, media and addresses the spatial and political context by examining the subject's physical and or virtual materiality. Dernière Ville, the subject of a photography book coming out in uh, October 2019, um, is a critical reading of the built environment within and beyond the city of Beirut. It is an ever-growing project that she started in 2013 and uh, was provoked by a personal uh, urgency to document what to her felt like the daily changes in the urban fabric as well as a need to decipher, to decipher excuse me, an overwhelming city. The urban fabric is surveyed across various typologies and scales, uh, producing photographs that contest the rigor of architectural representation uh, to record and reveal the vocabulary of, an, of a place infamous for its social and political intricacies. Uh, please help me in welcoming Yeva to the stage. Just a slideshow would be great. Maybe here. <laughs> F5? Five. F5 five is here, right. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> well, um, right. I had prepared an introduction. Now I have to eliminate all the things I was going to say. <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, and sorry, how does the slideshow begin? Because it's F5, but we don't know how. I have to move. Okay, great. All right, thank you. So um, this photography series um, that is currently some of the photos are exhibited at Beit Beirut um, is a is about the contemporary conditions of the city today, and um, it started when I had just quit my job in an architecture firm. And I had some extra time, so I thought, uh, why not get better acquainted with the city and the territory that I'm supposed to practice in? And even though it is pretty difficult, almost impossible to take a portrait of a city, uh, photographs of its multiple architectures uh, allow us to isolate, to interpret, and to attribute cultural value to the urban artifacts and phenomenon that photographs depict. I'm just very nervous when I talk, so. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my work is ongoing. <laughs> and 
eventually, perhaps, it can be compiled into an archive. But even today, if it is presented in sequence, it creates multi-layered statements about our society and the future it is building for itself. Uh, when I'm out in the field shooting, I always try to remain calm and contained when faced with this rapidly transforming metropolis and try to uh, draw attention to the composition of the world we live in. Uh, shooting full frontally most of the time and in deep focus, which tries to capture as much information and detail from the, the scene I'm faced with. Um, my work doc, uh, balances between document and interpretation. And um, yes, <laughs> and tries to communicate concepts that may be familiar to architects and urban planners, such as sprawling suburbias, uh, ephemeral urban phenomenon, systems of infrastructure, uh, citizen-driven appropriation of buildings. Uh, the architecture we see in a city and in, my and in the photographs is uh, not just the background for urban life, but is rather the inevitable result of it. And I'm going to uh, quote an old Arab saying, which is very heavy on the cough, al-mujazu qantarat al which basically translates to, the apparent is the bridge to the real. Because when we look at buildings, they tell us so much. Um, about the physical constraints of its material, which again should be the result of its time and technologies, As, uh, the economic constraints of its construction, the aesthetic parameters of its builder, and the culture, which in itself is the sum of imagination, perception, traditions, and aspirations. And then you have the buildings next to other buildings, which were built in different styles and at different times. And all that complex scene is under the pressure of weather and time. And ultimately, this gives us a taste of a personality of a society. Voila. <laughs> I guess that's my little presentation for you. <laughs> Thank you. Right back on stage, uh, Adrian, Yeva, and then we'll also be joined by Marwan Zwin and Mireille Abinasser. So uh, please join me on the stage so that we can get started. She is the vice president of the, the DAL, which is the Developers Association of Lebanon. Okay, so um, before we start, I just, uh, so that, you know, everybody uh, familiarizes themselves with each other's uh, practice and projects, uh, maybe I can ask Mireille or, and uh, Marouane to uh, tell us a little bit about the, what they do, their practice, and perhaps any um, research projects that, are, that they are working on that uh, 
you know, within the context basically of what we've heard uh, this morning. So, um, you know, if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do. This one. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, actually, I was so happy to be back to AUB after a good uh, 20 years. So uh, it was it felt good when I just entered the campus, even though this whole building was not here when I was uh, at AUB. And I was I was a bit intrigued, uh, not a bit, too much intrigued with the presentation of Adrian. Um, for us, we're, I'm, I'm not in architecture, however, we're closely related to architecture in our job because we're developers. So, um, but to hear, to hear such an intervention related to the collective and the global uh, relation was really striking for us because our day-to-day -day is so different than what you guys are doing. Our day-to-day -day is more dollarized, is more related to feasibility studies, how does it work, how much money will they make. So our day-to-day -day is totally uh, phased out of what, uh, what you guys are enjoying here. And I envy you, actually. So um, back to our reality, because um, many of you who are still um, not undergrads will go to and face the real world of the graduate architect that will not be able to implement a lot of his aspirations and a lot of the research they have been seeing, and especially when it comes to the layout of the modern housing that Adrian was, uh, was mentioning. Um, yes, we, we as developers would love to have new ideas, would love to be able to implement um, some really believer, a believer architect that believes in what he does and the design he's creating and how he's shaping, I'm sorry, a new, exp a new experience of uh, living. But still we have a lot of constraints to be able to do this. So uh, back to the real world, it would be good to, to try to combine between all the aspirations, the creativity that everybody appreciates, mind you, plus with the constraints of, the, of how we can actually get this to life. Because the developers, if we are talking um, private sector, which is the developers, we will talk private and public. Um, we as developers and, and me as being a founding member of the Real Estate Developers Association that was non-existent five years ago, we are really keen on having a lot of new ideas and new talents architecture-wise. And it's, it's pretty much intriguing now, and it's a challenge for developers to be able to introduce new designs, new styles, new ways of living, because yes, the two and three bedroom are not anymore what everybody's looking for. So we need to change the norms. And to do this, we needed to be, to be uh, in such an association, to be able to influence and lobby, because definitely the public sector is not doing anything about it. And is, is in, on the contrary, they're giving us hard time. And it's, it's, really, um, it's really frustrating to face this. It's, it's nice to, to want to do things, but to be able to implement in this, let's talk about Lebanon to start because we're living here. To be able to implement in Lebanon is not given at all. Like, um, I know that Tare couldn't make it here, but I know what he was about to say because Tare is with us at the association. Imagine in this country, as a developer, you have to do your own roads to get to the land that you want to, and even if you, and pay for it, definitely, and even if you offer to do your own road and pay for it, they will give you the trouble, because no, you're not allowed to do your own road. Okay, do it yourself. It doesn't happen. Was it the municipality? Was it the Majlis al Ma'awul Ammar? I don't know what is it called in... Um, you know, the, the Council for Reconstruction and Development in Lebanon, uh, which governs a lot of our, uh, of our work. Was it the Ministry of, uh, of Labor? It's, it's, it's really uh, tedious. But still, we want to have new ideas. We want to create new clusters, if we can, if we can say clusters. We need new volumes because of the constraint of the energy and resources, as well as the constraints of our aspirations, the aspirations of the future generations. They would not want to live like we did. They want something different. 
It's, um, it's very obvious in Lebanon, if you see, let's say, the 90s, the 90s, throughout the 75, even when the war started, until the late 2000, 2010, if you can say, the change, the change in the aspirations and in the, the actual product that was delivered to people in, in development was minor. You didn't see a huge change. After 2010, after, actually after 2008, after the, the whole crisis, the economic crisis, things changed. It, it doesn't mean that people didn't want to live in larger apartments, but they couldn't afford to live in larger apartments and their way of life changed. So for them, home has a different meaning and has different, uh, different usage than our parents. So starting 2010 until 2019, the change is drastic. It's like yearly changing. What you used to build in 2010 and sell will not sell in 2000, did not sell in 2015 and 2016. So it's that, it, we're not waiting for decades for things to change and for the mindset to change. It's like yearly or every couple of years you have to review your design, review your layouts, review your concept, review the cluster, review the, the urban planning of the projects that you're undergoing. So it's a constant revision of the plans. It's a constant contact with the, with the architects. And here from this, I, I would like to have I would like to, to have this bond, to, to really strengthen this bond between the developers and the architects. It's not that we're not against each other, we're, we're together. We're definitely together because we will be living in the, and, then, and our children will be living in the years to come. So we're here to really create this bond and try to do the best for the next generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll get back to uh, to this point, actually also linking it back to both uh, Yeva's and uh, Adrian's uh, lectures. Uh, but first, I just want to give uh, Marwan an um, opportunity to also tell us about his work. So, thank you. Um, actually, it would be interesting to discuss the, the question of developer and architect and see what happens in other countries, like uh, speaking of France, for example, where there are a lot of different types of bonds and they need each other. So they end up finding proper ways of addressing projects and mainly housing projects. But that's another discussion. Uh, well, thank you for having me here and having this uh, participation in the conversation. I'm, as you said, I'm an architect and a, and a faculty uh, at LAU. As an architect, uh, well, I work on what is available and what I try to uh, reach, bridge between research and architecture as a practice. Um, I'll talk about the research, which is twofold. Uh, when I teach with students and when I try to write, write and on my practice also. So I've been lately working on what are the kinds of bricolage we do as architects, the way we associate ideas and references and creative processes. So uh, the, the bricolage uh, that is done between uh, in our minds as projects, uh, what we try to put up together as references, as inspirations, as intuitions, so that's a very personal research that is part of uh, the practice. And uh, the other one is looking at the cities and the commons, the question of the commons, which is a quite uh, contemporary question. Uh, how uh, locals, group of neighbors, act as agents of change uh, particularly in a city as, be in be as Beirut, for example, where uh, situations, interstitial situations are still existing, are still possible as a form, as a concept also. How um, actually the old program, the typology of Maison du Peuple, I mean those socialist entities could happen here, actually happen when you look at uh, Armenian communities, for example. So this idea of uh, neighbors as actors of change uh, and how the porosity of the city that is slowly disappearing is still available and could be used to, to implement new ways of inhabiting the city. So that's the second uh, part of the research. So, yeah. I mean, and I, the, the, this one should also be working. Um, okay, so uh, actually just, uh, you know, kind of 
basing the conversation off of what uh, Marwan just said about uh, neighbors and neighborhoods as kind of actors of change, linking it back to uh, Mireille's, uh, you know, urge to kind of find uh, common grounds, I guess, between the highly um, research-based, uh, theoretical, and, you know, the realities that actually Adrian also um, started uh, his, uh, his presentation with. And, um, uh, you know, um, some numbers were, uh, what if I don't, uh, if I'm not wrong, um, by uh, every week, by, by 20, uh, but in the next 33 years, I think, you said that uh, every week uh, we will have to uh, build uh, 24,000 uh, six-story buildings um, in order in order to basically contain the population growth that we're faced with. Um, and, uh, and then you, you went on to, you know, in your research you're talking about how um, you're mapping somehow uh, new or current modes of living, changing modes of living constantly. And then you mentioned at one point, uh, you know, the, the kind of reluctance or the inflexibility of uh, real estate, uh, of real estate agents um, to uh, to kind of um, you know um, experiment, I guess, with uh, with new ways. Um, and obviously, we know that uh, again, as Mireille was talking, that there are uh, some practical uh, kind of uh, constraints. Um, my question, I guess, is a very basic one, um, and that starts with, you know. Um, these numbers and these kind of figures and this kind of research requires some kind of re reconciliation, reconciliation, oh, sorry, reconciliation with um, with uh, with the reality, um, with uh, the. So basically, we need this kind of um, bridging, I guess, between uh, what we see, what we need, um, and what we see. So how do we kind of how are we able to produce new cities without necessarily, you know, um, being uh, um, completely aggressive to what already exists? And this kind of is um, also present in the second part of your of your presentation when you engage with, um, you know, with indigenous communities. However, my question is perhaps, you know, a large one that kind of bridges both. Uh, both aspects of your presentation, and then perhaps also uh, what you guys have discussed now and uh, Yeva's work. Um, and it's about how do we kind of maybe move beyond this kind of dichotomy, so about reading the world, reading change uh, within this kind of dichotomy of you know the global versus the local, the old versus the new, uh, the, the community-based versus the developer-based, um, and how do we, then, you know, um, how could we inspire perhaps rather than thinking about, you know, um, the need to adapt to global visions within a local context, how can we ensure a kind of collectivity without necessarily always losing specificity? Um, and so perhaps we can, yeah. Um, thank you, um, everyone. I think it's also a, it's a really important discussion to have um, where, where can I start? Um, maybe the first thing to say um, with respect to this, like, what's real and not, and not real, yeah, or what's, what's representative of reality versus what's not representative of reality. I mean, whenever, whenever someone says that, they're making a political claim, yeah. Um, the definition of reality is always a kind of political claim. Um, and so I think, it's, from my perspective, it's important to also to really precisely diagnose what is extremely irrational um, within the existing state of affairs in which we have the dominance of private finance and speculative real estate as our primary mode of making cities. Yeah, so what's irrational about that? Um, the first thing that's irrational about it um, is that, as I said, the idea that capital appreciation on a dwelling earns more than a person who goes to work every single day is completely insane and it should be an, a political affront to everyone. Yeah. That a building sits there and earns more money than you do yeah, while you're laboring and working. 
Yeah, that's a definition of insanity. Yeah, that's completely irrational. Um, and why is that? It's because we have a highly commodified housing market. So the decommodification of housing should be a political goal for everyone. Now, of course, that's a very long-term goal, especially in a context like Lebanon, we have a laissez-faire economy. Um, even in London, yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to imagine. Um, what else is irrational about it? The other thing that's irrational about it is that um, real estate is never a response to a pre-existing need. Yeah, if real estate was a response to a pre-existing need, um, real estate companies wouldn't spend billions of dollars globally in um, creating fantasies yeah, and marketing and communication to give you a kind of aspirational idea of what your life will be like. Um, the kinds of housing we want are based on desires that are manufactured. And they're manufactured through all kinds of processes. And they're recent. Because we haven't always wanted to live that way. Yeah? Um, we haven't always wanted to consume as much. So when we talk about population, one thing I get very nervous about is that we should never raise the problem of population. And I hope this wasn't how it came across in the presentation um, in terms of the population is a problem. Um, the mode of life is, is, is what's at stake, yeah? Because you can have an extra three billion people living very modestly and the planet would probably be okay. Um, an extra three billion people wanting to live like um, an, an incredibly highly consumptive lifestyle um, is a completely different matter. Um, and of course with population, we know it, the, 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 the ultimate question is who decides who gets to reproduce? Yeah, which is, and we know history has all kinds of horrific examples of trying to control that for normally for poor black and brown people. So what else is irrational about it? Um, maybe the third thing that's really irrational about it is that um, there are just very basic human things that a current city making just doesn't deliver on. Um, so for example, the fact that extended families are important, the fact that like looking after your parents as they get old is really important. Um, all of those things are really difficult um, because of the kinds of social isolation that are produced by our, by our dominant city-making models, you know? And they're just very basic human things. Um, but they're not part of the, the, of the kind of fantasy that's sold to us. They're not, kinds of, they're not the kinds of desires we're being taught to have about how we're supposed to live. Um, so I think if you put all of those things together, um, then, then um, actually the question of what's real and what's not real, um, or what's a fantasy and what's not a fantasy is actually a product of what? Um, it's not a product of a kind of reality, it's a product of power. Um, and power of what? Uh, uh, the fact that we live in societies in which developers and private finance wield an extraordinary amount of political power and therefore get to determine what constitutes reality and what doesn't constitute reality. Hello. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, you were saying how you want to find um, new modes of, uh, of of living, and I was going to say we have to create a desire to live differently, <coughs> because if you're trying to sell the fantasy, like you mentioned, that you want to live in a villa which is gated and uh, which is very large <laughs> in in square meters, then that will be a problem because how do you house families and enormous villas, <laughs> you know. Why not create a desire to live together, share, um, for, we, can, we can be very specific. For example, the maid's room that we have now in every apartment being sold here. I myself don't want to have a maid and probably will never will. So why not? If we cannot remove the need to have somebody help clean your house, then create quarters in the building where they can live together, at least to have a community. Uh, why not create uh, shareable amenities, you know, why does everyone have to have a vacuum cleaner and a dishwasher and the laundry, create laundry rooms. Um, so I was gonna say, let's create different desires because currently we <laughs> will not fulfill, we'll, nobody will reach, well, very few people will reach um, the dreams that are being sold right now. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of 
issues and problems and uh, situations that we that we cannot solve, we cannot address, we cannot grasp beyond just looking at numbers or just seeing pictures, uh, but at our local situation, local individuals, I think it's pretty difficult uh, to even be able of being an agent of change. I think it's um, there's a question that's not being addressed because because of how politics go, but it's a question of governance and how uh, those megalopolis are governed actually and then beyond states, so they're becoming small entities beyond actual national borders. If you think about it, a country uh, and a huge city like uh, London or Mumbai or are more complex, more rich, more diverse, and at the same time people identify maybe more with the, con with the city in which they live than with the country. And actually, this is what might be happening in Europe. If you want to go beyond the actual borders, you want to create macro regions so that cities could be new states and the states just disappear as being regions. And in that sense, people who live, and that's another question of how these cities would be governed, people who would live in these cities would have a different way of governing and living together in a way that they can actually address questions that are usually addressed at state level. So uh, I don't see how us as small architects or whatever individuals living in the cities can now produce this change. But I think it's a really important question to see how uh, the needs there is a need to be to, there is a need for a shift in how these uh, these wide entities function. I, I think the um, the Lebanese question is very interesting because it's always a, a discussion of how are we governed and how or who governs us. And because it's also beyond the borders of a very small country, it looks at the Mediterranean. And um, there's something happening in Spain with the, the recent intent of being independent by the Catalans, that I'll leave on the side because I'm, uh, I don't want to uh, approach the subject, but there's something interesting how small islands and um, the rebirth of architecture in, as the Catalan identity has shown a bit what Mediterranean culture is. And actually, it's very interesting to see how the Mediterranean is this kind of very wide yet local entity around it or surrounding a kind of mix of seas. Uh, and I think it can be an interesting image and maybe an interesting landscape to look back and see how it could function. Because in the end, we really relate to very similar climatic conditions, a common ecology in a way, yet very different borders and states, but maybe even more similar than what Europe's and Europeans are to open questions and thoughts. Actually, it's it's pretty interesting because uh, yes, we do agree that uh, it would be even better for us developers to have a quarter for helpers or for domestic helpers rather than um, really having the headache of trying to fit in um, a helper's room in a hundred square meter, given that here you don't have Loa Carrez, so you have a hundred square meters actually <coughs> a 65 or, or 70. So yes, it would help us a lot, but we never had this uh, offering from architects around town. So that's why I was talking about bridging this gap and having more bond, because maybe the architects think that uh, we would not, we would, wouldn't want to conform with new ideas, but yes, we would, because it makes our life easier. Actually, it makes us sell more because people will pay less for their house if this quarter, helper's quarter, is shared with the whole building or the whole compound. Or so this is this is a very a very valid point actually, and we should we should pick up on this and build on it. And as for the notion of state and and complex and compounds, actually in Lebanon it's the easiest country theoretically to do this because we have. We have uh, space outside the city, but we need roads and infrastructure to get to it. So our only problem is infrastructure, because the, the small country that we have makes it easier to commute between the mountains. And we always had this 30 minutes from the mountains, from sea to skiing. Let's use it and, and do this for our living, to enhance our our living experience. We can do this. We have a lot of empty spaces that should remain green and lovely and lavish, definitely, with, uh, with innovative landscaping. Yet, we still, have the, we still have the luxury to have few accommodations around it. And actually, in Lebanon, I can say from my own experience and development, 
the people in Lebanon want more green spaces to breathe more and not to live indoors more, as um, Adrian had mentioned in his presentation. Yes, we do live a lifetime indoors, but because nobody gave us the alternative, or because the alternative would be to travel to the Tibet or to go all the way to the Amazon. No, you can have it. You can have a, a small, I, I don't like the word replica, but this is what came to my mind now, a small, like, you know, um, haven of, of, uh, of, for ourselves. And with the idea of communities, you can build your own communities. For, let's say, for instance, for us, we are building what we call Ahlam Golf and Mountain Village. We, we're building a village. It's a one million square meter. Out of it, 800,000 square meters will remain green and as natural as it can be, will remain as is. So, yes, it, it can happen. And it will be an, a village by itself. Um, um, uh, Taris, uh, Beit Misk compound will become, it became actually a village. They belong to Beit Misk. The people there belong to this community. And you can create a community that is compliant with various various groups of people's aspirations because nobody wants to live like the other. It's, uh, it's freedom we, and we believe in freedom. So we can do this, but we have to really join efforts and not keep on being scattered and just having different research. If we joined efforts, and it's a good thing that Collect Call did and started, and you should build on it to, to have more and more of these uh, conferences and actually re convert them into real projects. Thank you. Um, just based on this, I, I want to, you know, this idea of um, kind of, there are two approaches or multiple approaches, right? There is, um, you know, the, the, the kind of approach that uh, you're talking about, uh, Mide, uh, which is about, you know, um, kind of finding what is quote unquote an empty land and, you know, developing this. And then there is, you know, uh, Adrian, what, hmm? sorry? Creating it. Creating. By, by making it easier to get to. And existing empty land. Right. Um, and uh, Adrian, you mentioned with the lithium project, you know, the um, the kind of need or the, the, the striving to work with indigenous communities um, to, um, to basically, uh, um, you know, look into alternative uh, or not look into alternative, but basically uh, you mentioned basically the, the dispute about alternative modes of existence. Um, you know, so my question, I guess, is about, you know, the possibility at all to um, create a project or to engage with communities um, outside of an extractive approach somehow. So how do we, so even when we are engaging uh, people and communities that are, um, you know, part of a territory, part of a land, how or is it at all possible to do this without this kind of, you know, um, almost imperial nostalgia, what has been called imperial nostalgia, which is basically the longing to kind of bring back what one has destroyed uh, in a way. And how do we do this? Um, how do we navigate this kind of um, sensitive territory, I assume? You know, um, like there's a, that famous um, s s saying, it's a famous saying in Australia, but I'm sure you have like as an equivalent in Arabic, which is um, um, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, yeah? Um, and and it's like the, the whole point of working with indigenous communities is um, to challenge the perspectives that we have, yeah, and to confront them with alternative perspectives. And if, if you see the entire world as a resource, which is what colonialism always did, which is what empire did, um, then even if you want to manage the resource, yeah, um, you still think of it as something that is um, subject to manage management, that's something that you might buy or sell, that might circulate on a market, etc. Um, but there are other perspectives. You might think of something as sacred, for example, and in, there are lots of examples of those kinds of things in this country. But so, so from, from a perspective, so from what kind of perspective um, could you describe land ever as empty? Yeah. Um, from the perspective where 
the meaning of land exists insofar as um, is it developed or not. Yeah. So from the perspective of seeing the world as something to be developed, then you could say this land is empty, this land is developed. Um, and of course, that's the perspective of real estate development. Um, but there are other kinds of perspectives. Um, and those other kinds of perspectives are really important. And from those other kinds of perspectives, you would never say that land is empty. I would never say that land is empty. Um, land is always full. Yeah. Um, and if you can't see its fullness, it just means that you haven't adopted the right perspective yet. Um, think about deserts. You know, we always, um, from a European perspective, the desert was always um, uh, a kind of failed ecosystem. Yeah, it was what would happen to a forest if you didn't look after the forest. It would become a desert. So the desert is a kind of specter of failure that haunts every forest. Um, and so the desert's imagined as empty, um, but deserts are not empty. Um, deserts are full, um, but they're full of forms of life that make sense with that particular ecosystem. Yeah, we might not recognize them, but just means we've been lazy. We haven't done the work to try to recognize them. Yeah. Um, but to say that they're empty um, is, is, is the first step to say we can colonize them. Um, Australia, the, the kind of legal pretext in the 19th century that allows for the genocide of indigenous Australians, like many other countries, is terra nullius, an empty land. Palestine, Israel is exactly the same, you know? Um, and I think we have to pay attention um, a lot of attention to these kinds of political claims because actually, without even knowing it, what they, um, um, what they establish almost automatically is the idea of um, a, a kind of either a colonization at the level of the state or even um, at the level of like architecture, urbanization, infrastructure. I think we have to be very, very, very careful and wary about these kinds of um, forms of thinking this way. One other thing, um, you know, we always, we always like, we always present, we, we adopt a certain speaking position, I think, in these events in which we, you know, like, former architect, photographer, architect, real estate, non-architect, architect, researcher, like, um, but, you know, it, it's also just important to remember that, you know, from, from that perspective of your profession, things can appear hopelessly framed in certain kinds of ways according to the limits of your profession but you're also all human beings and people um and and i think it's important that we remember to speak as people as well not just as our kind of like with our professional disciplinary hat on um because then the question is not just like what is possible within our my job it's also like what is possible in my life politically in terms of like you know our actions and our ability to produce different kinds of solidarity with each other etc i think that's also really important to bear in mind Sorry. What about the possibility within within these kinds of um, professions, or you know, even within the the, the realm of research and uh, I guess uh, awareness of certain discourses and of certain um, you know practices? Um, how or is it at all possible to you know? when we're talking about indigenous communities, they are actually a resource as well, in a way. So how, how is it possible to approach um, these kinds of topics uh, or like, you know, um, create a kind of participatory practice without the, you know, the extractive or like the kind of, uh, you know, othering of, of these realities, which I imagine is a challenge as well for you. That's, a, that's an excellent question because um, I think, in a way, the, and, and the talk at Ashkel Alwan on Monday at 8 p.m. Um, on the Sharjah Architecture Triennial um, is, is really going to be all about that because um, it's the fundamental question um, one faces when trying to put together an exhibition in which the participants, um, because they don't sit within the sphere of cultural production, because they might be activists or indigenous groups or whatever, like, what do they stand to gain from being in an architectural exhibition? You know, they can't monetize. Um, their participation in the way that we could all monetize our participation in something like that. Um, so that, that forces you to think about non-extractive relationships. So it's not collecting and gathering work um, um, only, um, but there are forms of either, you know, mutual projects emerge or there are 
uh, forms of reciprocity in which we find ways of working alongside um, people to deliver practical benefit to communities um, in exchange for having the permission to show work. And those, so so that they're exactly the kinds of questions that we're trying to work through in the architecture triennial because you're really, you're right. Um, otherwise it just repeats that kind of extractive perspective. Thank you so much. Um, we have a little time left for any questions from the audience. So if anyone has some questions, please raise your hand. Oh, Yeba has something to say. Sorry, I didn't see this. Sorry, sorry. Go for it. Hello? Yes. Um, speaking of extraction and developing empty land, I mean, that is very important, I think, in the context of Lebanon. Because, I mean, this, as we all know, the city is just sprawling and sprawling and sprawling. But if you, I mean, with Adrian's first project, we looked at, um, I don't know how the, it was a machine learning that allowed us to see to, or to, to, to read maps better. But I think it would be very interesting to see how much empty real estate there is left, like all the pockets that are left as we sprawl further and further from the center. Um, whether they're empty because they're not bought or whether they're empty because they're bought for investment, um, I think, okay, well, the commodification of real estate is a long, long term goal, as you said. But perhaps there's some kind of way, and <laughs> I don't know, I'm just suggesting this here. Um, what do we do with all this empty, empty real estate? And there are cities um, that are trying to claim this back. I think there was something in Spain and England, maybe in Canada as well. Um, so how do we bring that back to the people? Because otherwise we'll just keep on sprawling and sprawling and then <laughs> there will be no more empty land at all to left to develop. I'm just saying this out there <laughs> as an idea. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a question, actually, because I, there, was, there was something which I read, I came across a little while ago around um, planning, a shift in planning requirements in Barcelona in which the life cycle cost of buildings is being calculated in a new, in a new way. I wonder if you knew much about that or whether you'd come across it at all, because that seemed to me to be really interesting as a way of trying to factor in the cost of a building, not just, at, you know, over the, like the seven years, but like the... 50 years or even like 100 years in terms of its maintenance and etc. <laughs> no, I know something about uh, uh, not allowing um, owners to leave an apartment empty for a maximum of certain time, which has been implemented with taxes. Uh, or the question of the Airbnb, Airbnb, of course, in Barcelona was a huge issue. Uh, about the assessment of the, the value of a building, no, I haven't heard of anything. I know that, for example, um, paradoxical case is uh, Oporto that was in Rune, the city center of Oporto was uh, completely abandoned in a very bad uh, state. The government and the state was uh, bankrupt, so there was no way they could add money to rebuilding infrastructures. And actually, uh, a, a correct, say, implementation of Airbnb has allowed the city center to, to reburn, reburn, re re-come back, if you want, in a way. It's still under control. It's not uh, as abusive as it's been in uh, in Barcelona, but uh, I th people are still in good terms with such uh, endeavors. Running those uh, with your question, uh, I don't have much to make on that. It's also really interesting in Barcelona that um, the current mayor is an anti-evictions activist. Was. <laughs> was. She's, was. She's, she's not, sharing she's now. The mayor. She's sharing. But it was a great, yeah, yeah. it was a great, uh, a great try, a great uh, uh, possibility. Yeah. Barcelona is, uh, but it's been, yeah, I've, it's not a discussion on how this happened. Um, but I, I think to, to, to get back to uh, what Yeva was saying uh, about the, and the land, uh, the empty lands, or what you call the empty lands, I think it's, it would be interesting to see how you can reevaluate what is available in Lebanon as empty real estate, and why or how come nobody uh, has tried to rebuy old, maybe it doesn't fit, maybe they're not adapted, maybe the typologies are not fit, which I think is maybe the issue. Maybe the bad construction also doesn't allow them to be reused. But I think it would be interesting to try to recycle without destroying what is existing. I mean, the amount of empty offices is, 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 is amazing. And just knowing how the economic level, the economic situation is, it could be maybe worth a try. Just one thing. 
empty real estate, you mean as in n yeah, built but not occupied? This is what you mean? Oh, oh okay. These, are, these have so many uh, reasons for why we have these. And one of the major things of, of, of this problem, definitely the economic situation and what, what's happening in the world, but again, it's, um, it's the value of the, of the building because uh, here in Lebanon, we don't have this 25 years lifespan for a building after that. Either you rehabilitate to be more, to be more compliant with the modern times uh, type of way of living, or you destroy to have something else in, instead. Definitely, we're not talking about the classified assets, which is um, an issue of its own because we were, it's been a while, a few years ago, a few years now, we're trying to introduce this new law to preserve them. Yes, we developers, we do not want to destroy these. We love them, and I personally love them, and I think this is the cachet of the city, a cachet of the city that I would like to restore, rehabilitate, and keep, because we're losing it. So I'm against, uh, I'm against actually, and we at, uh, at the association, we're against this, this, um, this uh, whole uh, wave of having uh, something very strange within a certain city or a certain environment, we actually adopt the feeling, we adopt the, the this course of, yes, we build within the same spirit of a certain quartier, a certain region, a certain area, a certain city. For, this is for us, from our perspective. So, um, and yes, it's, I guess it's challenging for architects as well because they will have to, to merge between the old, like let's go back to the 50s, 60s and nowadays, and it's not easy when it comes to the choice of material, when it comes to the actual layout and design and how do you, how do you lay out the whole space and how do you do all your, you know, your accessibility and everything with the constraints of the parking spots and with a lot of, of constraints of nowadays. So yes, this is very important to, to discuss and it should have another, another session with uh, actually with some people from the government that are uh, not doing anything about this. They're being reluctant to adopt these new laws. And for, as for empty land, uh, actually I like what you've, what you've uh, said and it's totally true. From our perspective, it's empty, and while it's not empty, actually, it's just um, terminologies that are differing. And yes, it's it's kind of political, and you know, because of the whatever we've inherited from long time ago. And just another example of our project in the mountains: it's um, we have a hiking trail that we have designed, a five kilometers hiking trail within the project where we have designated the actual fawn and floor, everything that's existing there, from the plants to the actual insects to the serpents that are existing. And we have, we have made it a point to actually put it to life and put it highlighted in, on, on panels along the trail to actually come back to your idea of, yes, this is an inhabited land. And if we are to come and join these uh, other uh, species and cohabitate with them. We should do it while respecting their uh, their their life and how they are existing. And I totally agree on this. Thank you for correcting me on empty. Thank you. Which part of Lebanon is the one million project? It's in Kferdebien and in, uh, in just down the road from Fara. It's a new community around golf and equestrian and hiking trails and biking trails and you know enjoying nature. There's snow. I mean, it snows over there, right? It's at um, 1,400 uh, of altitude. Yeah, there is snow. Adrian, I have a question. Maybe perhaps a last question, and then I promise I will open it up to the to the audience. Um, and it is about the first part of your your talk, um, and uh, you know about the 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 project, the machine learning based project to kind of collect, I guess, um, layouts of buildings and housing and how people live, um, which reminds me a little bit of um, Doxiadis' uh, human community project at the end of uh, the Second World War in Greece and Athens, um, and how they basically collected uh, data via this uh, survey um, on how people lived in the city as a way to kind of also inform 
you know how uh, the you know how to design um, the city, how to expand on Athens, um, how to organize uh, Athens, I guess. Um, so my question is perhaps, um, and maybe you've mentioned this, so forgive me if I missed that part. Um, but my question is about you know um, the usage kind of. So what do you do? What's your what's the the step after the kind of collection and perhaps you know um, a way of uh, of doing so is to perhaps work with uh, people from the from the real estate uh, uh, sector rather than kind of you know creating this demonizing uh, rift between uh, between the two uh, the two sectors so because you know um, there are precedents I guess of very heavily um, researched projects that are actually that that came to be um, in this kind of um, merging or or you know yeah, no, I, I, you're right and, and I'm in fact a um, uh, real estate company and um, researchers in um, real estate from Imperial College in London are our major partners in the project so we're working with um, with real estate companies um, I have to say also because um, real estate companies have the largest data sets of interior floor plans. <laughs> So, um, so it's a really, it's, a, it's just a really valuable resource for us. Um, but ultimately, like the aim of the project is, is is to do two things. One is is a response to what you just said before, which is to understand um, what is our building stock like, you know, um, and and I think as we we are for sure gradually moving to the moment where the amount of new build will become less and less and less and less, you know, um, because of material scarcity. And resources, we, and your land scarcity. We're just going to have to get a lot better um, and more inventive at modifying what we have already. Yeah, I think everyone agrees that that's that's happening. Um, and so, in a way, this is also just to kind of is, is to say, well, what do we have already? You know, um, what is its capacity? Um, so, what, one aspect of this the project is to look at like repetitive structural typologies, of course, because that determines so much of what you can do with the building afterwards. Um, and then the other part is to do it like like let's say more to do with like floor plan and layout and lifestyle. Yeah, so they're the two dimensions of the project. So that's one, one thing. What we also wanna do is then to see whether we can, if we cross reference it to demographic data, to find out like for example in London, um, what kinds of households living in uh, two or three bedroom terrace, terraces, mm -hmm. um, are they what we think they are? Um, and if they're not what we think they are, um, are they catered for somewhere else in the market? You know, and that's using a very just like a straight um, um, acceptance of the fact that at the moment, housing provision in the UK is um, delivered through the private sector. And what would the private sector understand as an argument? Um, there's a market that's not being fulfilled. Yeah, so we're, also, we're very happy to work pragmatically um, in that kind of way. Um, it's just that I always feel the need to reiterate that, you know, on, on one hand, we have to distinguish between like a kind of the, the practicalities and the pragmatics of, of how we work today, um, but not lose sight of, a, of also a political horizon in the longer term of what we're really wanting to aspire towards, um, which is not simply to um, to make the best of the, of, of the kind of scraps that are thrown to us, which is the current, which was, you know, in London, for example, is what, with, with a kind of, you know, uh, extreme level of homelessness of the likes of which that city hasn't experienced in, in um, in decades, um, and then you know this is being repeated all over the all over the world, um, and so this is like this is like a morally unacceptable position to be in. So you know what do we do about it? And I think we have to distinguish between tactics and strategies. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to challenge Mireille on some of the things that you were saying concerning the real estate sector in Lebanon and how it, developments actually happen. Um, my perspective is that the real estate sector in Lebanon has a very profound problem when it comes to social responsibility. And what I mean by social responsibility is not that 
you know, we destroy an entire mountainside and we cut down thousands of trees, but we build a five kilometer hiking trail. It doesn't work like that. It's, it's sort of like a little, you know, you know, yeah. My idea or my, my problem with it to say the least is the fact that, for example, we come to a city like Beirut, which is already overcrowded. It's very poorly planned. There is no form of public transport. And then every 10 or so meters, we have these gigantic skyscrapers going up, most of which are empty, because they're also being used as a front to launder money from other places around the world. And this is basically how our real estate sector works. I want to hear your comments on this, because honestly, there's like an elephant in the room, and you've all chosen to very diplomatically avoid it, which is that, essentially. Actually, towers every, every block is not only in Lebanon. This is in Singapore, this is in New York, this is in uh, every major city, if we're not going to mention the Cairo and Lesotho and the cities that were mentioned in Adrian's uh, presentation. It's, and the fact of money laundering, it exists in real estate and so many others. So it's not only in real estate, yeah. The, the money laundering through real estate might be um, a very interesting, intriguing medium that's, that we see because the building, we actually see it and it distorts our sight and sometimes it's really a pain to see it. So yes, it's the same with you and me. When we go, when we pass by Beirut, I feel the same pain that you feel. So urban planning and the fact that real estate developers made it to do these ugly things is not is not is first our fault. You know, the, because I always take responsibility for for the others. It's uh, it's a whole sector that was not standardized. The association was only created five years ago to try and retain the real developers and you know ban or or get get out of the the old mentality of building a building with a cousin and whomever is around so nowadays we're instigating the the idea of real estate development tatwir laqari which did not exist back then plus definitely the responsibility and the the actual the actual um, they have a big role to play, the government. In Lebanon, we would love to live without government because we do everything ourselves, but they, they are, the, the government is there. And the public sector, the private sector cannot do what the government should do. We can try to influence, to lobby. This is why you created this association. And actually, you're all welcome to be, to be giving us ideas and suggestions because yes, we would like to preserve as much as we can. Uh, Mind you, it's not just because of the ethical part of it, it's also because it pays off. So here is the bridging the gap. The developers should have got this concept that since 2010, that concrete does not pay off anymore. But they didn't because we had no research like what Adrian's doing elsewhere in the world Unfortunately, we don't have it here, or we, we are, it's not well mediatized, because I don't know of it. So maybe it's there, but we're not, we're not really, we're not bridging this gap to have more, more bond, to bond more with, uh, with doctors such as Adrian that are working for the best of the future generations. And plus, yes, the, it's not enough to do one small thing and destroy whatever is around it, and I totally agree. And back in 2010, when we have, back in 2008 actually, when we have started the first residential lead, leadership in energy and environmental design residential building, everybody thought we were crazy. And they're like, what the hell are you just, you think this would sell? Like uh, less toxicity paint, who cares? And actually people cared, but we had the guts of, of introducing this because we had this, we believed in this and we hated what we had around us. So uh, yes, it's something small, it's a small building, it's nothing, but if, if we start with this, our private endeavors and we can replicate these, and this is what we're trying to do through Ridal to make, to make, to, to show these developers what it, what it really takes and what it, what it is to have a healthy, sane city to live in. So yes, I agree with you. I hate whatever I'm seeing. 
the same. It's not, we're not gonna argue about this because what's ugly is ugly. And what's disturbing the eyesight is disturbing everybody's eyesight. And money laundry is here. It's not that we're gonna stop it now. We're gonna, <laughs> yeah, it's not like, not me nor you. Someone else is taking care of this, I guess. But it's like, it's like, yes. Nowadays in Lebanon, even you cannot do this, you cannot do this uh, concept of laundering money through real estate because it doesn't work anymore. Because if you are to build a building, you will never gonna sell it and you're never gonna have the liquidity back again to where it should have been. So we're even on this where it's not working. But so we have to go somewhere else and be more realistic. But also because our economy is collapsing. It is collapsing. It's not, uh, it, it is, but we're, not try, fire, we're trying to do our best. We cannot just sit there and say, it's collapsing, it's money laundry, we hate it. We have to act and try to really ha lobby together to act and do something about it. We can just stay. On, on, on the note that, um, that the Lebanese, um, the, the kind of global attractiveness of Lebanon to money launderers is declining, um, um, I'm, not, I'm not in a position to judge whether that's true or not. Um, it's probably not a bad thing um, if it happens. But, but in fact, and it's an amazing point that you bring up because it just goes to show you how much of our cities and therefore our mode of life is just a second or third order consequence from capital flight, some of which is money laundering and real estate financial speculation. That is what makes cities, yeah? The rest is kind of window dressing. Yeah, and we know we know that for a fact. It's just window dressing. Um, but would you, for example, within your association, um, support controls on capital flight into Lebanon? Um, would you support controls on um, occupancy of buildings, um, et cetera, et cetera? Because because my, my, you know, my understanding would be that you know, the, the members that you represent, um, if, if they were lobbying the government, they would be lobbying the government to do precisely the opposite, right? To, 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 to maintain those controls. But, but um, I'm, I'm ready to be enlightened. Actually, it's not the control and capital control. This is not my, my realm because I'm against control. Was it controlling architects or controlling creativity or controlling capital or whatever? But what we can do is that we can create frameworks and set up and standards to avoid this. To, or actually to channel this capital into some, something else, to channel them to fund research, such as the research you're doing um, in Chile and Australia, because it lacks in Lebanon. So it's not the idea of the control, it's the idea of what you do with it. And I, I totally agree, it's the idea of what we do with this capital. We want to draw capital to the country, but not to destroy to make it better, to make it a better place to live. This is what we believe in. And I'm sure that it's not across the, across the board, but at least you can start with something. And if you have ideas and if you have research, let's try to work on this. Let's try to see how we can, we can help out. And on the idea of lobbying, actually we have been lobbying against, with the government, against the, uh, the, you know, the Anunet Tasuye that was out, that everybody was, that the, the, um, the syndicate of, of engineers was against. We were also with them on this, but it doesn't work this way because it's not about us. And we are, yet we have projects for billions of dollars. Yes, I agree. Yet we might have a financial weight, but we're not standardized and lobbied in the correct way. It's the same as the lobbies of the Arab world and the States. It's like, you know, if we are not together, collectively, trying to get somewhere to a one goal, we're not gonna get there because the others are way, way more, more powerful. So we would like to lobby for preserving the heritage, and this is, I'm, I'm responsible of what I'm saying, and we're working towards this. And we've already presented papers to the government, to the parliament in this, in this direction. We want to preserve the, city, the, the, the resources and the natural resources, and we were working with them to, to at least give some leeway for renewable energy and for new, new um, uh, actually new uh, material that we can use, alleviate few, a few taxes on new material, which, uh, which happened to be implemented the opposite way because they increased the taxes on it. So whatever makes sometimes makes more sense in other countries or is 
is a beaba here in Lebanon. It doesn't work this way. We're like working a lot towards this. But I believe that, yes, with Cal and with other people around the world and other Lebanese around the world trying to do the same thing, but we should be we should be synergizing our efforts. It might work. I don't I don't have negative thoughts. It might work, but we have to try. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Jessica. I'm uh, from Nahno organization that is a research and advocacy platform. And I'm very, interesting, uh, I'm very interested uh, in the fact that you are lobbying for some laws and that you submitted papers, etc. Can you just give us uh, more information about which laws and maybe later we can talk about possible collaborations? So actually, we were we were talking about how to uh, we were talking about the law of preserving the heritage and um, the paper that was presented by the by the syndicate of engineers and we actually met with um, with the head of the syndicate and we tried to lobby with him as well for this. But sometimes you have a lot of politics in Lebanon. The 2012 revisited version of it, yes. So we want to work on this, and we want it to be um, actually where everybody would think that the developers wouldn't want to do this. Yes, we do, and it helps us a lot. And this is one thing. We were trying to work on, on the ability to give permits for development companies to open up their own roads for the transport and to give more leeway to municipalities to give to give the permits for such projects that would be would be definitely stamped as uh, as um, you know solid uh, okay uh, it's, it's compliant with all the laws and regulation definitely but we don't have this so far we want this we want to increase we want to help with the transport issue of the country because this is where some of the capital that's flowing into the country might go so yes, these are, these are the, the legalities and difficulties that we face throughout our tedious days with trying to deal with, uh, with the public sector, with the, with the government, actually, or paragovernmental uh, association, um, institutions. So uh, these are two things that now come to mind, came to mind. And a lot of other things, let's say the control, the bureau de control, how we can enhance and have more stringent, um, uh, stringent uh, laws and, uh, and, um, and, and compliant work. Uh, because it was a bit erratic how it was done and how it was created like uh, four years ago. So we wanted to make sure that we enhance this, uh, these efforts and channel them and funnel them into, do, into making, making better things in the country and enhancing the landscape. Yeah. So these are things. I'm Just one thing, because an, an answer to Nahnu, I mean, in, in the conversation between Nahnu, would you also advocate for a transportation system, like imagining that Beit Misk would offer buses? Well, that would be trying to reduce congestion. Would you imagine that you would advocate for a planning of the territory? Because it's not planned. The main issue is that there's no planning. Yes, but 80 believe it or the not, territory is not planned. the government did not know, give them. The, that's what we're lobbying for. For the planning of the territory, so no, saying for, that you not could for not the build planning, for, for example. Not, not in, for for the planning, definitely, because the urban the planning, planning the, the Tanzim Modani in Lebanon is not, well, not doing what it should be doing. Actually, it's just yeah, we know that. But yeah, it's no, but we need to act. We need to act and do something because it would mean that you cannot do a golf club in Kardedien, for example. Right? Might. But that's why you could try to move forward. It's mine. Also. I think we can thank you so much. I think yeah, thank you very much. Conversation off stage, and we can break up for a Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Great time, and for talking about the law. Monday after the PMC.